Dear friends and music lovers, welcome to this live broadcast. We have seen a beautiful video of Virgo Interferometer based in Pisa at Cascina. Today is with us the director of the European Gravitational Observatory, the laboratory that hosts Virgo experiment, Professor Stavros Katsaneva. So warm welcome. Hello. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's a pleasure, it's a real pleasure, and thank you for being our host today. Uh, the major this year, who have loved to be um, present for the event of the year at Virgo Interferometer in Pisa, uh, which unfortunately was suspended due to the coronavirus. Can you tell to our viewers uh, what Virgo is? Yes. Uh <clears throat> Probably one should start by seeing what we want to do and then explain what Virgo is. You know, for, uh, for uh, Galileo and Newton, the space was an immobile and uh, internal framework within which objects move. They changed from the previous rhythmic understanding of space, of the antiquity, and it was a mobile and, as I say, eternal, uh, a Newton called it, called it sensorium day, was the senses of the guy. And then Einstein came, and this was a big, a big it was a very big and very interesting, uh, of course, it was the beginning of modern science, and this is no doubt about that. But they could not understand with this why one body attracts another. Uh, again, Newton said, hypothesis, non finger. I don't make hypothesis. Why? He could make a perfect law, Newton law, but he don't know how this thing happened. And then Einstein came and said, look, what happens is that a mass, an object, deforms space around it. And the other object, if you wish, moves inside this deformed space. And what we see as attraction is essentially movement of one body in a deformed space created by the other body, and vice versa. Now, when you have this, when you have a violent effect, when two bodies, two black poles, two neutron stars, collide or make a fusion, it's a violent effect and starts making waves in space-time. And what does that mean? That means that the distance between two, let's say, objects starts increasing and decreasing, and I made the opposite image, but decreasing and increasing, so it oscillates. So our purpose here is to see this oscillation that it is due to the gravitational waves. And how do we do it? It is an interferometer. Virgo, it is a huge interferometer. What does that mean? It is a laser line that goes into a mirror that splits it into two big arms, and when I say big, they are big, they are three kilometers on each side, they make an L, so light goes up and down, but comes back, and then through this mirror, is recomposed again, and goes into the detector. If all distances are the same, the two lights that come back and forth are what we call in physics an opposition of phase. Position of phase means the maximum of the one of the first wave is the minimum, uh, corresponds in time with the minimum of the other. And when they both come together, the maximum and the minimum are near. And so you have light plus light equals darkness. This is if everything is perfect and nothing moves. Now a gravitational wave comes, distorts the space, distorts these distances, and then we see appearance of light because it introduces the change in the phase of the light coming born, coming back from this mirror. It's a long explanation, so, um, I it is complete. I, I read also on the website of Virgo, uh, it's a collaboration involving many countries around the world. Uh, how many people work on this project? It is, the Virgo collaboration these days is over 500, it's close to 550 people from 11 countries. We have to say that this thing started by the ideas of uh, 
two grandfathers or forefathers or whatever of Rodrigo, which were uh, Dalberto Giazotto, Pisano, and uh, Alain Brillier. So this is not a very long time. And they incited uh, their corresponding agencies, which were CNRS in France, and IMF and Institute of the Physical and the Art, National Physical and the Art, here in Italy, to create EGO and in, in order to host this uh, antenna. So it's essentially made, the infrastructure is essentially uh, funded by these two uh, big, uh, uh, let's say, institutions with good contributions from Netherlands, from uh, Nikkei of the Institute, Nikkei of the Netherlands. And then there is, uh, and this is essentially you know, the infrastructure, and then of course you have a lot of scientists contributing strongly with their work and their also ideas and also bringing instruments from 11 countries in 550. Um, how do you manage uh, this great project uh, in this hardest time uh, due to the coronavirus? Yeah, it was a very interesting problem and uh, I think uh, uh, we did uh, relatively well because uh, we defined very early with the document the different phases. And the first thing we had to stop was the visits, of course, at the schools and outside there. That was called phase one. Then phase two was when we uh, let, said to all the people that were not absolutely necessary uh, their presence here and they could work at home, to work from home. And this reduced our personnel to the order of, I don't know, 20%, I mean, the order of 15 people or something like that. And with this, we continued to run. And then came the strongest phase also for Italy. And then we had to stop together, actually, exactly in synchrony with our colleagues in the US. We stopped both live and video stopped at the same time. And very soon, and this we did for many reasons, because of course, first of all, the help of the people is the priority in this case, not the senior. Congratulations for for your effort during this hard time, uh, Professor. Um, also, um, I finish. I wanted to say something. Oh yes, uh, please. Uh, and then immediately when things became when Italy entered phase two, we also came back to phase two. So now we are we are open. We are open. I mean, I would reduce personnel, but we're open for preparations. Yeah, sorry, I wanted. No, that. That's great. I want to say congratulations. <laughs> congratulations for your effort to continue this great project. We have a lot of questions to ask you. We are very curious because, as you know, the major TV works on classical music and the, uh, um, the sound of the space is a theme uh, and a topic treated by Pythagoras and Kepler, but also a composer dedicated uh, to the space, for example, Bach, uh, the dance of the sphere. Uh, but um, we often, as a public, consider space as silent, and uh, we know also gravity modified the space around us, uh, also the alteration of the ripples and the vibration of the body. But how does it take to reveal the sound of gravity? Yeah. Why we call it? First of all, it's a, a story of uh, the celestial harmonies is a story that always fascinated also person, scientist. And uh, yeah, I have to tell you uh, an interesting story afterwards. But uh, the first thing, why we call gravitational waves that we've heard the sound of space? Of course, as you know, sound in order to propagate needs air. And uh, you know, in space, we don't, we don't have air. But what happens is that this, this signal that we receive, the deformation of space, if you analyze it in our interferometer, in Earth interferometers, it, its frequencies are from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So these are exactly the range of the ear of what, what, what we hear. So if you just take the signal of ear and you plug it directly, the frequencies to a megaphone, you listen to the music that it is there. Many of you must have heard of it. So it is, you don't need special sonification techniques to do it. You do it directly. 
That's why we say we've heard the sound of the universe. And I add to it because since young, I was fascinated with Pascal, who said the internal silence of this, uh, no, I'm sorry, the silence of these eternal spaces always makes me feel like frightened, fear, and have power. And, uh, you know, I say, uh, joking, that no, Charles Pascal, don't feel power because we've heard now the sound. And when you don't have only the image, image, without sound is sometimes menacing. It's called sublime. When you add sound to image, you start creating beauty, which is social. It's something that it starts to become more uh, like home. I mean, if you add also odor, it's like feeling like home, feeling you're inside. You have the sound, you have the odor, you have the, you have also the image. I mean, that's, that's what is the, the social beauty in Jewish, the beauty that's inside society and not very far, even menacing, I mean, when it looks about without any sound, what is the science? And this is probably what the antiques wanted to do, try to, to embed their society into the cosmos, try to do, try to do it through these harmonies. I mean, the, there is harmonies in space, harmonies in Earth, and how are they correlated, correlated. This embedding that we have lost, many, I mean, it's a big story. It, we try, with a different manner, it's not so easy, of course, try to recreate it somehow by getting other images we call multi-messenger, image of the universe, adding to the image the gravitational waves, therefore the sound, and when you detect high energy particles, I say what is odor, odor is particles entering into our nose, therefore when you measure the cosmic particles, you are in some sense having the smell of the universe. So that's a little bit the, the story that you can say about. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I should say something else. Oh. The Celestial Harmonies is a very interesting story, and I, it's a story I'd like very much. We have a lot to say, and, uh, well, we have a lot of questions to ask you also, Professor, because Virgo is to a great discover since Einstein relativity and Virgo Liga pushed the discover to another level, an exceptional result being able to pick up the sound of the collision of two black holes. Uh, do you want to explain to us as a public how it could be possible? This was, you know, because we said all that, but it is uh, very, very difficult. If I can uh, use it, uh, I mean, if I can use another metaphor to explain what's happening, is we want to keep these three kilometer objects there, uh, these lasers that pro propagate into the vacuum, come back, etc., etc. It's as if we want a ruler that is very precise to stay immobile without moving, and then when the wave comes, starts making, making this ruler osseal. But you can understand, when you have this thing on Earth, everything that moves, can change this ruler. The Earth that has its vibrations is missing. The passage of the clouds. What is a cloud? It is a mass of water. A mass of water can affect a mass. Newton law, I mean, can affect the, the disposition of this. Cars, uh, windmills, airplanes, everything can affect this. So it is a very difficult task to isolate this ruler, this standard ruler, from all what we call anthropogenic noise. In passage, one of the things we were uh, uh, sorry to stop with COVID uh, detector is that because of the, of the measures, our noise that was coming from anthropogenic movement was down by 25 to 30 percent, that was seen everywhere. The seismicity of how the earth vibrates because of the less uh, traffic lower down and therefore we were more sensible to the cosmic signal. So you first have to interact with the atmosphere, understand 
Even we have a very interesting study and with the University of Pisa, how the waves that hit on the shore of the Iranian Sea, this is a mass that moves again. We can measure them and we try to see how, because they say that the climate change influences the rate of waves in the coast and has an ecological effect on the, on the fauna and the flora and how it has also effects back. So, again, the main message here is you have to have a very precise instrument, isolate it properly, understand everything that happens on Earth. And once you understand that, then you have to detect a small change that we never said before in this, uh, in this uh, interview. It is one thousand of the diameter of a pole. It's a very, very, very small change. So the task is tremendous, but you make it. At the end, you manage. And once we did that, we started seeing the black hole, uh, the black hole collision, and then the neutron star collision, which was even more exciting. In fact, because once we saw it, there were seventy. Uh, uh, observatories around the world that we detected with other signals, like electromagnetic uh, radiation. No. It's a big step in science, of course, and uh, uh, we are also interested because as musician I can say I'm very interested in the sound of space. And also, um, I'm very curious about, I want to ask you, about an experiment on musicology and science in modern times, maybe you know, it's a kind of figures of Cladney and Lisa Zhu, or those of Harry James and the Countess of Cymetics, well, music produced figures based on their vibration, so we can see visually the sound that produce matter, it's correct to say that? Yeah, this is where I should tell you a story. Yeah, I would add to what you said that I know, and it's fantastic, it's very nice. You also have the famous theremin, which is how, with your body, you change the environment around an electromagnetic wave and you produce music. Theremin was a Russian uh, physicist and composer, things like that. It's a very fascinating thing about that. Now, let me tell you now something that we're doing and we're very excited about. So first, yes, I, I think these are very interesting uh, works of art and science, and I would also mention Theremin by the Russian, uh, uh, where you, the bodies, the presence of bodies changes in the magnetic environment. And so sonification is a, is a very interesting and very exciting. Uh, I have to say a, a story that followed me for many years. Exactly, related to Kepler and the, and the you know, Pythagoras and the celestial harmonies. That once, uh, uh, Princess and Wilson were the, the two physicists that discovered the big mean sound, I mean, discovered that there is, we are embedded into a radiation that comes from the Big Bang. Then they went to the Nobel Prize and they were next to a, a, to a literary person, Isaac Bashevit Singers, who turned to them and said, ah, it's true that you have heard the Big Bang, heard the Big Bang. And then he said, ah, oh, yes, yes. They went back and they took the electromagnetic waves they had just detected and translated to acoustic frequencies. And they gave him a cassette. And they said, yeah, you can hear the Big Bang also. So there are ways to sonify everything. And it is a very interesting thing, and we're doing it. And we are very lucky to have here a program uh, funded by the European Union about sonification of data. And there we collaborate with a fantastic woman called Wanda uh, Diazimov uh, uh, said, who is an astronomer, who is a blind astronomer. She became blind at the age of 20. And her goal now in life is to sonify all the astronomical data. So, A, that people that do not see can do astronomy, that's one thing. But B, and to which I fully uh, subscribe, is that probably through sound you, you will have better uh, possibility to understand the signal and separate it from the noise. She tells me, Stavros, you people that see have always two tendencies. A, to linearize the problem, 
that is always expect that something grows up or goes down. That's the one thing. The second thing is you stationarize. Stationarizing in, in common language means to you expect the same frequency to repeat itself. I mean, essentially, you expect more or less repetition. And you don't understand when there is a change in frequency, you believe that it's noise. But sometimes it's not noise, it is signal. So, adapting the perceptive world, world uh, of the world, the perceptive world of, uh, the, of the blind, uh, or the acoustics in general, I think it is an increase of our perceptual capabilities. And with this, we have a program with artists and scientists working on that. And certainly we can use it for what for our purposes, that is to distinguish a signal from background. And here again, I always cite Freeman Dyson, the great physicist that died a month ago, that said the, the problem of life is not a matter of energy. It is a matter of distinguishing signal over background understand the meaningful signal of what it is the ambient background. So this is music. This is uh, music for science, for uh, for art, for society. It's the same thing all the time. And that's 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 a little bit what with the a very interesting program with uh, I mean, uh, also artist, another artist, Donald Fortescue that uh, goes to the South Pole and uh, with the weeds makes music. And then here we had another artist, De La Porta, we together with Valerio Boschi and uh, Irene Fiori and other people in Ego. Uh, they made an experiment where they played music with a prehistorical flute and our gravitational wave detector registered. So if you want to hear how it looks like a gravitational wave sound people you can hear. We had we made also an exhibition called the rhythm of space which I did. I suggest you go in YouTube, you say YouTube the rhythm dello spazio and you you, you see uh, the whole exhibition there where a lot of uh, the exhibits are around sound. And for instance one very famous artist Thomas Saraceno where he, uh, he shows particles how they move in the sound a little bit to what you have in semantics, but they're different, very, very, with a big room, you enter in and you have particles that move into the sound that music is made, and sometimes they collide, sometimes they gather and they make structures, etc., etc. There are, there are a lot of points in common between science and music, and it's a pleasure to speak with you, Professor. Of course, I want to stay with you for hours to listen to these interesting things, and I think all the viewers of the Major TV, both musician and both interested in science, are so happy for this interview. Uh, the last question is about your social media. We want to follow more about the Virgo project. Uh, your your website and of course um, the next project soon some anticipation for for us yeah I mean I think if you just type uh, I don't have in mind exactly the details it's if you type ego uh, uh, minus GW gravitation wave .it, you fall into uh, the website and then uh, from then you can go either to see the video itself or go inside the other thing. So, and we're actually, you come at the moment we are uh, refurbishing this, and actually next week I think will be very different. Yeah. We, we, of course, invite our friend musicians. Um, I want to thank also Professor Valerio Boschi, who made this interview possible. And uh, I would love to thank you so much for this great and illuminating interview. I hope to come personally to visit uh, the project shortly, maybe eventually, <laughs> uh, when the pandemic will finish. I wish you a good work. Uh, be strong. Keep the aim high. <laughs> And uh, we we'll wait for you. Hopefully, in a few months, I think we will start uh, we'll open again and wait for you because we do a lot of visits both on Tuesdays and Saturdays, and people come. That's great, that's great. 
Of course, my, my, my portable piano is always for you at disposition. <laughs> and uh, well, see you soon and thank you very much and uh, see you again soon. Bye. Bye-bye.